السلام عليكم ورحمة الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد All thanks and praise are due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and may his peace and blessings upon his last and final messenger his family, his companions, and those who follow them until the end of times. Alhamdulillah, last week, we explored the meanings and lessons of verses 2 and 3 of Surah Az-Zumar. So inshallah, today we are going to be looking at the meanings and lessons of verse number 4. And we'll start off like we do every week by reciting the verse first. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لو أراد الله أن يتخذ ولدا لاصطفى مما يخلق ما يشاء سبحانه هو الله الواحد القهار So just as a really quick reminder Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he opens the surah by stating تنزيل الكتاب من الله العزيز الحكيم The revelation of this book is from Allah the Almighty, the All-Wise. إِنَّا أَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الْكِتَابَ بِالْحَقِّ فَاعْبُدِ اللَّهَ مُخْلِصًا لَهُ الدِّينِ Indeed, we have sent down the book to you, O Prophet, in truth. So worship Allah alone, being sincerely devoted to Him. أَلَا لِلَّهِ الدِّينُ الْخَالِسِ Indeed, sincere devotion is due only to Allah. وَالَّذِينَ اتَّخَذُوا مِن دُونِهِ أَوْلِيَاءِ مَا نَعْبُدُهُمْ إِلَّا لِيُقَرِّبُونَا إِلَى اللَّهِ زُلْفَى As for those who take other lords besides him saying, We worship them only so they may bring us closer to Allah. إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَحْكُمُ بَيْنَهُمْ فِي مَا هُمْ فِيهِ يَخْتَلِفُونَ Surely Allah will judge between all regarding what they differed about. إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَهْدِي مَنْ هُوَ كَاذِبٌ كَفَّارٌ Allah certainly does not guide whoever persists in lying and disbelief. So in this last verse, in verse number three, we are told about one of the excuses the mushrikun of Mecca would make for associating partners with Allah. So deep down inside, they knew that they were mistaken, they knew that they were wrong, and they knew that corruption had crept into their system of belief. So they would offer this excuse saying, مَا نَعْبُدُهُمْ that we worship them only so they may bring us closer to Allah. And this is clearly a lie and a weak excuse. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, That on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself will judge and decide between the believers and the non-believers regarding what they disagree about. And he, in terms of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala having associates, partners, equals, or not. And certainly Allah does not guide whoever persists in lying and disbelief. And last week we ended our discussion uh, speaking about the topic of al-hidayah. Speaking about the topic of guidance. In verse 4, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explicitly rejects their claim that he has a child or offspring. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَوْ أَرَادَ اللَّهُ أَن يَتَّخِذَ وَلَدًا لَاصْطَفَى مِمَّا يَخْلُقُ مَا يَشَاء Had it been Allah's will to have offspring, He would have chosen whatever He willed of His creation. Subhana, glory be to Him. هُوَ اللَّهُ الْوَاحِدُ الْقَهَّارُ He is Allah, the One, the Supreme. So some of the pagans, some of the mushrikun of Mecca, they claimed that the angels, na'udhu billah, were the daughters of Allah. That was one of their false beliefs. That was one of the corruptions that had crept into their system of belief. So they would claim that angels are the daughters of Allah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He explicitly rejects this claim. Hypothetically speaking, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala were to have offspring, he would have chosen whatever he willed of his creation. And this is a hypothetical. It's a hypothetical made for the sake of argument and to correct, uh, correct concepts, to correct people's ideas and beliefs. 
that had Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wished for a son, had Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala desired an offspring, he could have chosen any of his creatures, that his will is free, it is unrestricted. However, he in his ultimate limitless glory has made himself free of any such need. Hence, no one can attribute a child to him and such is his will and determination. Why would he need a child when he is the creator and originator of all who controls everything. And indeed, everything in the universe belongs to him, and he can do with it whatever he wants. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala emphatically declares his might, his power, glory, independence, and he rejects the claim that he has or needs offspring. Subhana, glory be to him. So oftentimes this expression subhana, uh, it's translated as glory be to him. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is far greater and far above the need of having a child or offspring. That is not something that the divine has. So subhana, uh, it's tra uh, translated as glory be to him. And the translation, it does feel a little bit awkward. It feels archaic because we generally don't speak like that. When we engage in conversations, when we speak with each other, uh, we don't say glory be to this or glory be to that. It sounds a little bit strange. So um, we don't use this type of language, we don't use this type of syntax in our everyday conversations or writings. So the meaning of subhana is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is absolutely perfect, pure, and exalted. That when we do the tasbih of Allah, when we are uh, proclaiming and announcing His perfection, we are saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the divine, he is absolutely perfect, pure, and exalted. That He subhanahu wa ta'ala is free of any need, deficiency, shortcoming, or blemish. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pure and exalted from the false, baseless, and absurd claims of the pagans. Subhana. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the divine, He's almighty, He's all powerful. Perfection belongs to Him and Him alone. He does not have any needs, he does not have any wants, he does not have any desires. He does not resemble his creation in any way, shape, or form. Rather, he is Allah, the one, the supreme. Now the word Allah itself is a very powerful and profound word. Uh, it is the proper noun for the divine being, the one who is necessarily existent. It is the proper noun for the Almighty Lord and Creator, the one who created this universe and every single thing it contains, the all-hearing, the all-knowing, the all-seeing, the all-wise, the Almighty, the one who gives life, the one who gives death, the King of all kings. That this is the name, this is the title that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen and selected for Himself. And it is considered to be the greatest name and the most comprehensive name of Allah. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself has chosen and selected this name for him because it's his greatest name and it's also the most comprehensive. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the name, it's the proper noun that is used to refer to the one who possesses all of the divine names and attributes. It is the one name that combines and brings together all of the divine names and attributes of Allah. That when we say Allah, when we call to Allah, when we hear the name Allah being mentioned, we are referring to Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Al-Malik, Al-Quddus, Al-Salam, Al-Mu'min, Al-Muhaymin, Al-Aziz, Al-Jabbar, Al-Mutakabbir, Al-Khaliq, Al-Bari, Al-Musawwir, Al-Muhaymin. We are referring to all of these divine names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is why Allah, according to several scholars, is Ismullah Al-A'zam. It is the greatest name of Allah. It's the most comprehensive name because when we say Allah, it includes all of these divine attributes and names and all of these attributes of perfection. So Allah is supposed to be a very powerful word. Uh, it's supposed to create a sense of awe, reverence and fear in the heart of the one who hears it or mentions it. And that is one of the descriptions of the believers that's mentioned in the Quran. That when we look towards the Quran, there are several passages where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is defining the true believers. And those descriptions 
are actually descriptions of the Sahaba. They are descriptions of the companions of the Prophet Wasallam, the best generation of believers to ever walk on the face of this earth. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes them, He says, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا ذُكِرَ اللَّهِ وَجِلَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ That the believers are those that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioned, their hearts shake, their hearts tremble. That as soon as they mention the name of Allah, or as soon as they hear the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, something happens to them. They go through this range of emotions. Right? They feel a sense of love, respect, awe, reverence, and fear. Wajilat kulubuhum, their hearts shake. So wajan, uh, it's described as a type of fear. Now fear uh, usually has a negative connotation. That we are afraid of our enemies, we're afraid of, I don't know, wild beasts and animals. Children are afraid of the dark, they're afraid of imaginary monsters. So fear has a negative connotation. But when we're talking about the fear of Allah, this is not a negative emotion. It's a positive emotion. Because it's coming from a place of love. It's coming from a place of reverence, of awe, of respect. That because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so magnificent, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so grand, because He's the Almighty, the All-Powerful, when His name is mentioned, wajilat qulubuhum. Because when we hear Allah's name, we think of Al-Aziz. We think of Al-Qahhar, the Almighty, the Overcoming, the All-Powerful. So Allah is the name that the Qur'an and Sunnah most frequently mention when referring to the Lord of the worlds, the Creator of the heavens and the earth. And as I mentioned, many scholars assert that this is the greatest of all His names. And Allah is a special word. It indicates the only being in existence who truly possesses the qualities of divinity and lordship. This name belongs to him alone. No one else shares it. It can never be used as a name for anyone else, and no one else can claim it for himself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the proper name of the only one who is worthy and deserving of worship. The one whom all creation praises and glorifies, that everything on land or sea, indeed everything in the seven heavens and the seven earths, glorifies him. Uh, and they praise him day and night. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, تُسَبِّحُ له السماوات السبع والأرض ومن فيهم. The seven heavens and the earth and everyone in them glorify him. وَإِن مِّن شَيْءٍ إِلَّا يُسَبِّحُ بِحَمْدِهِ وَلَكِلَّا تَفْقَهُونَ تَسْبِيحَهُمْ There is not a single thing that does not celebrate his praise, though you do not understand their praise. إِنَّهُ كَانَ حَلِيمًا غَفُورًا He is the most forbearing, the most forgiving. You know, this is a very profound verse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that the seven heavens and the earth and everything they contain, they glorify Allah. They declare Allah's perfection. They declare Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being pure. And every single thing, whether living or non-living, animate, inanimate, it praises Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the mention of Allah, it should invoke these feelings and emotions of love, admiration, gratitude, appreciation, thankfulness, humility, awe, reverence, and fear. But the only way for that to happen, right, the only way for our hearts to shake uh, when we hear His name is to learn about Him. Right? The only true way of nurturing and developing a strong relationship with Allah, of building a relationship based on love, is to learn about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through His divine names and attributes, through His own speech, which is the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He ends the verse by highlighting two of His unique divine names and attributes, Al-Wahid and Al-Qahhar. So Al-Wahid, the one, Al-Qahhar, the supreme. So the most important fundamental belief of Islam, our most important belief as Muslims, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one. He is Al-Wahid and He is also Al-Ahad, the unique. And both of these names, they come from the same root letters. And they represent His oneness, but they are used in different contexts. So Al-Wahid means the one, and theologians specify that this one is not referring to a number. 
He is one in that he is singular, without any equal, rival, or partner. It refers to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being the one and only true God, the one and only true divine, the one and only who is worthy and deserving of submission, surrender, servitude, and worship. It also refers to his being the first before whom nothing existed. This in turn communicates that no one deserves to be worshipped besides Allah and that he has no partner in divinity. Allah's name Al-Wahid, it's mentioned 22 times in the Qur'an. Right? The name Al-Wahid, it is mentioned 22 times throughout the Qur'an. So he is the one uh, who has no partner, the one who is unique and incomparable in his attributes and his actions. He alone is worthy and deserving of worship. The name Al-Wahid oftentimes is paired with the name Al-Qahab. So Al-Qahab is translated as the dominator. That while human beings may be able to dominate others, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us that He alone is able to dominate all. And additionally, human beings very rarely, if ever, dominate by themselves. They need armies, backup, they need allies and weapons. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dominates without any help, aid, assistance, or support. So Al-Qahab, it comes from the Arabic root letters, Qaf ha ra uh, which convey the meaning of to dominate or to subdue from above. Uh, the name Al-Qahab, it's supposed to inspire feelings of, again, awe, reverence, humility within our hearts. It's supposed to create a profound sense of reverence for Allah. The divine name Al-Qahab is mentioned six times throughout the Qur'an. So everything in creation is directly subjected to Allah's power and will. You know, part of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being Al-Qahab is that every single thing in this universe, every single thing that exists is under the control, it is under the domination of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Likewise, Allah sends His angels to carry out His will over creation. And Allah's absolute sovereignty over creation is clearly evident in the world in how Allah maintains and governs all of its affairs. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created these particular systems. He has instituted particular systems, and those systems are implemented in this universe. And that's how the universe functions, that's how it works. And this system is very precise, it's very perfect, it's by design. This is something that was created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and is under His direct control. And that's something that's an observable reality. You know, it doesn't take a rocket science to, a scientist to figure it out. You don't have to be some like very uh, uh, intellectual individual that has, you know, higher degree of education. Just going out into the universe and observing these natural phenomena will help you understand the might and power of Allah. That Allah is Al-Qahar. That everything is subject to His will, His divine, and uh, his, his, his decree. And His power it will be even more evident in the hereafter. And that's why we see the more emphatic form of the name Al-Qahab being employed in the following verse. That يَوْمَهُمْ بَارِزُونَ لَا يَخْفَى عَلَى اللَّهِ مِنْهُمْ شَيْءٍ لِمَنِ الْمُلْكُ الْيَوْمِ لِلَّهِ الْوَاحِدِ الْقَهَّارِ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the day all will appear before Allah. Describing the day of judgment. That on the day of judgment, every single human being, from the beginning of time until the end of time, from Adam السلام, all the way to the last human being, will appear before Allah. لا يخفى على الله منهم شيء. Nothing about them will be hidden from Him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows every single detail about every single human being. لمن الملك اليوم? He will ask, who does all authority belong to this day? لِلَّهِ الْوَاحِدِ الْقَهَّارِ To Allah, the One, the Supreme. Um, it's reported in a hadith uh, recorded by Imam Muslim, rahimahullah, that everyone and everything that has ever existed will die on that day, except for Allah, the Eternal. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will then ask, لِمَنِ الْمُلْكُ الْيَوْمِ Who does all authority belong to this day? Where are the kings of the world? Because I am the king. And since no one will be there to answer, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will answer himself, لِلَّهِ الْوَاحِدِ الْقَهَّرِ That all sovereignty, all authority, all power belongs to Allah, the one, the supreme. So this is a very uh, profound and powerful way of ending the verse. And part of the reason or part of the wisdom for ending the verse in this fashion is to strike a sense of fear and humility in the hearts of the pagans who deep down inside of the hearts knew that they were mistaken, that they were wrong, that they were uh, being told the truth by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Subhanah, like glory be to Allah. How perfect is He? How amazing is He? How awesome is He? Who Allah? And He is Allah, Al-Wahid, the one, Al-Qahar, the subduer, the supreme, the one who dominates. So we will uh, end here for tonight, inshaAllah. And we will continue and carry on with verse number five next week. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept this small effort of ours. May He place on our scale of good deeds on the day of judgment. Uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among those who not only recite the Quran, but try our best to engage with it, uh, understand its meanings, reflect on them, implement them into our daily lives. May the Quran be a proof for us, not against us. May the Quran be an intercessor for us on the day of judgment. وصل اللهم على نبينا ومولانا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم جزاكم الله خيرا والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله